So are you worried about how your tax dollars are being used to bail out banks? Trust me, you better be. We heard from two different government watchdogs in D.C. today. They said TARP funds are ripe for waste, fraud, and outright theft, and Congress better do something fast. Drew Griffin from our Special Investigations Unit is following the money from Atlanta tonight. Now, Drew, not a lot of confidence on Capitol Hill. Not on Capitol Hill, not anywhere, really. It's a real fear roll in the taxpayer money could literally be wasted or even stolen. Now, TARP, which stands for Troubled Asset Relief Program, is so huge and so few people are keeping track of it that the inspector general in charge of that is saying Congress needs to make some changes. Separately, Roland, earlier today, Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner testified before the Congressional Oversight Panel, and before he even started, the chairman said what has so many Americans worried, that there seems to be no accountability, no way for the American public to know that their money is going to any good. It just seems to be going to Wall Street and banks, and, and the TARP money came with no strings attached. Now, here's what the Treasury Secretary had to say about accountability. The President said this publicly. I've said it publicly. Going forward, where institutions need exceptional levels of assistance, we will make sure that assistance comes with conditions that provide for the necessary degree of accountability help ensure these firms emerge stronger rather than weaker. And that's an important principle. We're committed to do it. Going forward, that was the key there. Roland, the biggest issue is transparency, whether or not even this congressional panel is getting a clear picture of where the money went and is going now. But Drew, while the hearing was going on, the Special Inspector General's latest report on TARP had loud and dire warnings that criminals will be going after this money, right? Yeah, this was making headlines before Geithner even got up to the Hill. In fact, according to the Special Inspector General, they already are seeing this money, not just flat out criminals trying to go after it, but high-level influence peddlers, those typical Washington corruption and conflict of interest connections that unfortunately uh, we've become accustomed to. He issued a quarterly report today, a one startling revelation, the fact that his office has already gotten 200 tips on possible criminal activity. There are 20 investigations and another six audits underway. We're looking at accounting fraud, securities fraud, potential insider trading, uh, corruption issues, really what you would expect when you have uh, as much money going out in such a short period of time. It's sort of the typical array of white-collar crimes. And one of the warnings he issued, uh, Neil Borofsky there, singling out a program that the president's uh, $75 billion plan to buy back those troubled assets. He says if there aren't big changes to this mortgage refinancing thing, that fraud is going to be ripe here. The safeguards need to be put in place in advance. He says his office is on top of it, trying to use a multi-agency task force from the FBI to tax investigators to attorneys general's office across the uh, nation. But when you read this report, 250 pages, Roland, you get the sense of just how overwhelming, overwhelming the task is going to be. Uh, the money to make sure it isn't stolen, they, they, they not only want to track that, but actually to see if it was worth it. We're talking about a whopping three trillion dollars in various programs to see not only that it was rightly placed, but once placed, did it do anything? Roll. All right, Drew, thanks a bunch. You gotta love Congress. Well, at least Neil Borofsky has some power. His top investigations could lead to criminal charges. The Congressional Oversight Panel? <laughs> All bark, no bite. Joining me now, Eamon Javers, a financial correspondent for Politico.com, Peter Schiff, president of Euro Pacific Capital, and of course, Jessica, Erica, Lisa, and Ron. Look, uh, folks, I, I don't understand this. Um, basically, all of us have about as much power uh, as this oversight panel. So, uh, Eamon, explain what in the world is going on. Why do you create an oversight panel and they have no juice? <laughs> well, it's got name and shame power, really, is all it's got. And they've name got and the shame. Juice. Wow, and, that's, that's great. And they've got the juice to haul Tim Geithner, the Secretary of the Treasury, before their own panel and ask him some very pointed questions, as they did today. That does have some influence in Washington. But, Eamon, we can ask him questions. are afraid of being hauled in front of Congress to answer questions. Eamon, right? we can ask him questions, but, but having a panel with no power, right. how, do you, how are you effective? Well, it's going to be very difficult. Basically, all they can do is drum up publicity around the issues they think are concerning. There is a proposal on Capitol Hill to actually give these guys some subpoena power so they can actually force people to turn over documents and conduct a real investigation. But for now, that power lies with a special in inspector general over in Treasury, Neil Borofsky, who's conducting those 20 investigations. So there is some investigation going on here. But, you know, we've seen this in the past with Katrina and with Iraq war spending. You know, when money is moving out of Washington, 
Washington fast and low, somebody's going to steal it. And you can almost guarantee that's going to happen again this time. Uh, much better than the Pirates. Hey, Peter, you think the government should just scrap this whole thing, right? Well, sure, there's no right way to administer the TARP. It, it shouldn't exist. You know, bankruptcy is a healthy part of capitalism. When the government props up insolvent companies, it undermines the whole system. And, of course, you know, from a legal perspective, the, the TARP is unconstitutional. You know, we're a nation of laws, and the government has to respect our laws. They just can't do whatever they want. And this thing is just going to be a giant boondoggle. The politicians are going to take all this money, and they're going to route it around to their friends and their buddies, and they're going to, it's going to go to where politics wants hey, it, Peter, not hey, to Peter, where it needs what, to go. What part yeah. of the Constitution prohibits giving, giving money to companies that are failing? Well, you never. The way our Constitution is written, the government only has the authority to do what the Constitution says it can do. Yeah. And there's nothing in the Constitution that gives the U.S. government the right to bail out private companies. So because there's to no buy specific stock provision, in private we have companies. to just accept another Great Depression potentially? No, no. <laughs> They're going to cause another Great Depression. Look, if we would abide, if we would have abided by our Constitution, we never would have had the bubble. And so it wouldn't have had to burst. But now that it's burst, we need to deal with the consequences. We can't keep sweeping, sweeping them under Peter, the rug. Peter, yeah. Peter. The Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution allows uh, for the regulation of interstate commerce. I but, understand you object to this as a policy, and that's fine, but we went through this during the Roosevelt administration, <laughs> where they engaged in exactly the same sort of deficit spending, exactly well, the same type of bailouts. No, it's perfectly constitutional. No, it's you not argue constitutional. It's a bad you, policy, no. Fine. You, can, you can't court. throw this under the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause does <laughs> This has got nothing that's an abuse of that clause. The well, according to you, the government can do whatever it wants. So let's just tear up the well, Constitution. Well, I've been pretty much seeing that. Now, Erica, of course, this has a direct impact on the average household. How so? Well, it did. In fact, there's there's a group called uh, the Ethisphere Institute. It's a nonpartisan research think tank. And back in December, they started uh, looking at TARP funds. So they created this TARP index. And as of right now, what it means beyond the confusion that everybody at home has over what the heck is actually happening here and with their money, according to this uh, this TARP index that was created by Ethisphere, pretty much each household in this country has lost about a thousand dollars now this is in terms of the money that was invested in TARP. Already, one hundred seven billion of that has been lost. So. Basically, for folks at home, that's what it means. And to they're, add on they're to gonna that, they're going to lose a lot more than that, you know, because the government has to create all this inflation to fund the TARP. And so, because of what the government is doing, the average American is going to see his cost of living rise dramatically, and the value of their savings evaporate. Well, the bottom line with TARP, Roland, also right. is that the the Treasury Department said the whole point was to increase lending. And today, Geithner said, frankly, it's been a mixed bag. We haven't seen great results. So the very purpose of TARP has not been realized. Amen, so remember final, too, e amen final comment. Amen. We, well, the, the Obama administration is in sort of exquisite political agony here because it looks like the results of these stress tests are going to come in later in this month or early next month. And it might be that some of these banks need even more money going forward. And there's already so much controversy over this TARP that it's going to be very, very difficult for them to finance that that's going to be the next political challenge ahead ah, for the Obama folks. Ah, more money. Great. Even if he, <laughs> thanks a bunch. We certainly appreciate it. Get out your checkbook. There you go. Panel, hold tight one second. Folks, good students.